fabulous guest on, Richard Harvey. He's going to be speaking about his new book. He's, a, he's got about four books out. He's a very talented author. And um, his background is in humanistic and transpersonal psychologies, Taoism and Zen. And he's trained in Western psychology and Eastern meditative methods and psychospiritual psychotherapy and bodywork. And his new book, as I was just saying, um, you say your sacred calling, awakening to the soul, awakening the soul to a spiritual life in the 21st century. He's going to be telling us about that when he gets on here. But he's actually calling in from Spain. He's in the Andalusian mountains. Hello, is that you, Richard? Jen, hi, it's me. <laughs> hey, how are you? Richard, welcome to the show. How are you? Hey, Gary. I'm very well, thank you. How are you doing? Oh, I'm well, too. Thank you for, thank you for being on with us. Yes, yeah, well, thank you for having me. <laughs> and you're calling, of course, from uh, Spain. And uh, my daughter's I'm calling from me. southern Spain. Yeah, yeah, wow, fantastic. I love Spain. So... Um, we do have somebody on air asking if you're going to be doing a healing. Shall I just ask her what sort of a healing she was thinking you were going to do? Because you will be doing sure. a beautiful guided meditation later, won't you? Which will probably involve yeah. a healing, won't it? So I'll just bring Donna on yeah. air a minute just to say hello. Hi, Donna. Oh, hi. Hi, Richard. How are you? Hi, Donna. I'm good. How are you? Good. Thanks. Um yeah, you know, I've had great moments of sacredness and holiness where I just want to drop to my knees because it's it's just indescribable. And this happens during my meditation or walking on the beach sometimes. But lately I've had a block with money, I think. Somehow there's a block there, and I don't know if it has to do with a past life or something. Maybe I have this other thing going because of, um, I don't know, past life. Maybe it's a nun or something like that. I don't know. But is there any way to clear that? Donna, I think that uh, this must be an instance of synchronicity because if you stay with us a little later, I'm not exactly sure when Jan will tell us perhaps, um, I'm going to do um, a guided meditation about releasing energies into the heart center, which is virtually specifically to do with what you've just shared. Oh, and that's so, interesting because I just read yeah. a book too called Heart Math. Very interesting. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, uh-huh. oh, I, I, I love your meditation. Yeah, definitely. Love to hear that. Stay with it till then, and I think you'll find it addresses um, what you've just been telling us. Oh, good. Wonderful. There you go. Well, thank you. I will do that. Uh, yeah, that's handy. So, thanks for your call, Donna, and I'll put you on mute. And yeah, if you want do. to. Okay, if you want to contact Richard after the show, anyone who's listening can contact him on www.center, spelt the American way, T-E-R, centerforhumanawakening.com. And that's all one word, centerforhumanawakening.com. Okay, so we'll just uh, let Richard tell us what he's going to tell us about his fabulous book and his tour of... England in Europe and uh, Canada when he starts that next year. Just uh, tell us what you're going to be up to, uh, Richard. Well, the tour is exciting. The first and maybe the book. Um, the book's just been released and uh, um, with Austin McCauley Publishers. It's called Your Sacred Calling. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we're very excited about it at the centre because um, it's given me a chance to speak about... Uh, sacred spiritual uh, matters in in depth and um, the book is all about uh, the real spiritual relationship and the real spiritual um, process of awakening and uh, how it actually comes about it's really it's a book that's been a long time for me in the making you know I've been writing for a while now my first book mm-hmm. was uh, 2002, and um, this one's been a long time coming about. And it's, a, it's all to do with spiritual illumination, awakening in this lifetime, and the relationship with a guide or a mentor. 
Um, it's also to do with um, what you need to avoid in the spiritual world and, and the ways in which we can go wrong and take wrong turns, should we say. And um, perhaps most importantly, it's about something that I came to call a custodianship of spiritual truth, that we all, in a sense, have a responsibility or an obligation to take responsibility for preserving the sacred spiritual truths that in many ways are fading from from our world. You know, I know, you know we get together here uh, this evening to talk and we're all interested in spirituality and so on, but, you know, so many people aren't or it's uh, supplanted by religious thought or dogma of some sort. And um, I'm stating a case for everybody uh, taking their unique spiritual journey in this book. Mm, well, so I agree with that. Yeah. Calling. Mm-hmm. That's brilliant because we've five... all, sorry, I was sorry, just going to say we've, we've all incarnated at this particular time in order to help yeah. the planet. And uh, so, you know, that's uh, so true. It's about find your own calling, find the way in which the spiritual, the sacred is calling to you to uh, be a part of the collective awakening. Mm. And uh, it's been great to actually have a chance to really talk about that in some depth in this book. Wow, sounds brilliant. And that's available on Amazon, you said. Did you say? That's on Amazon and all the other places, yeah, you know, Barnes & Noble or whatever, and, uh, you you know, all those um, online booksellers. Yeah. Wow. And also, hopefully, in your local bookshop. You never know. (laughs) Oh, good. (laughs) Well, that'd be handy, won't it? And... And thanks for asking about the the other thing that's a big thing that's going on for me is the enlightened moment. The enlightened moment is an event. I'm bringing it to, it's a three-day psycho-spiritual event. And we're bringing it to um, the UK and Europe in January, February and March. Mm-hmm. We're going to um, England and uh, Spain and Portugal, Ireland in more than one uh, venue at the moment. And there's actually um, invitations at the moment from various other places like Brussels and Romania and there, you know, we're waiting to add those to the schedule. And then in uh, April, May and June, we're going to North America and uh, we're starting in Ottawa, uh, capital of Canada. And... um, Hopefully we'll get down to the USA, San Francisco, California, and uh, Florida, and places like this too. Mm. That sounds amazing. Wonderful. Well, like I, a world you know, I'm really excited about it, and I know Robert at the Centre of Human Awakening is also excited. We're very excited to be going out. Um, you know, physically, we've done a lot of meetings and uh, groups and courses, of course, and satsangs online for quite a long time now and um, mm. so this is the first time we ventured out as a center for human awakening and it's the first time I've actually gone abroad for about three four years now to run an event and uh, so it's really exciting for me to be going out and actually meeting people and the interest is fantastic the interest we've had back from posting on social media and our contacts and network and so on has just been wonderful um, just people coming out the woodwork saying we love your work and we really want to experience it, you know. Wow, Wonderful. brilliant. Well, we do have another caller on the switchboard. Shall we find out if what they would like to say? Because if anybody okay. has any questions, they can always ask Richard. I'll just um, get this caller on, on the 480 area code. Hello, who's speaking, please? Hey there. Hi, this is Shiloh. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, I was just going to listen, actually, for a few, and then... All right, um, okay. I thought he Shalom. Was, Wonderful. He was Sorry. talk about his new book Sh- or something, Sharon, so I was just going to listen for a few. Sorry, I didn't quite catch your name. Is it Sharon? Uh, Shiloh. Oh, Shiloh. Hi, Shiloh. Hi. We've spoken before, haven't we? Um, okay. We have. Right. Okay then. I'll just I'll put you back on mute and you just have a listen. And then if you have any questions in a while, we'll um, 
let you ask them. Okay, then. So, you've had some fabulous reviews about your book, haven't you? You've had one from Professor Ian Norman at King's College London in the UK. And he yeah. said, I encourage anyone who is being challenged by life issues or who wants to deepen in their understanding of what it means to be human to read his books. Well, that's praise indeed, isn't it? Yeah, it's lovely to get um, testimonials and people writing in and saying, you know, I want to support the work. And, you know, we've got a lot of that. I think we wound up on the centre website doing a whole testimonials link. And it's just lovely, you know, because it's great to be able to reach people and mm -hmm. to perhaps perhaps put over the point that the awakening that's taking place is a collective matter. You know, so it's about let's include people, let's... Um, you know, let, let's get the message out there. Mm. Well, the reason I picked that one was because they're from England. <laughs> but uh, you've yeah. um, uh, testimonials from all over the world, haven't you? I do, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, what's great about publish? you know, publishing is really difficult at the moment, as you know, any writers know. It takes a while to get a, um, to get a publishing contract. And, of course, you know, you want a publisher who's got a, a reach, is able to distribute well worldwide and um you know i've been quite lucky in that regard i mean my first book deal was just a second phone call it was quite extraordinary really so you know i've been very fortunate in uh, the publishing world so far but it's getting more and more difficult i have to say but it does mean that you can reach people and people call me from you know long way away you know australia or uh, West Coast, America or China or whatever, to say they've read Your your Essential Self, which was the book before Your Sacred Calling. And, you know, they say it changed so much for me and thank you and all these wonderful things. It's great. It's great to wake up to messages like that. Mm. And your um, three stages of awakening are discussed in your book, Your Essential Self. And... Um, that sounds really interesting, doesn't it? The um, three stages of awakening. In a nutshell, three what would you say they are? Three stages of awakening are right at the centre of uh, my work, which is we call now the way of sacred attention. And it incorporates sacred attention therapy, which is, uh, you know, we have an online training course for sacred attention therapists now where you can train in a certificate and then a diploma in practicing sacred attention therapy. And sacred attention therapy works with the three stages of awakening. And briefly, the first stage of awakening is liberating or freeing yourself from the conditioned life or the life that looks to the past or is mm. uh, related to childhood, should we say or is repetitive, you know, and, and incorporates emotional behavioral patterns that you feel limited by, yeah. uh, that goes into the second stage of awakening. The second stage of awakening is the one that really the guided meditation I'll do later is, um, is all about, which is energies rising into the heart center. And in the second stage of awakening, you live from your authentic self out of compassion and exclusively in the heart center. You realize that love isn't an, a personal matter, really. Love is, love is and it's impersonal. And uh, uh, compassion reigns, really, in the second stage of awakening. And in the third stage of awakening, it's um, a commitment to the spiritual life. Mm. Sounds absolutely riveting. What I've tried to do is, Sorry. is yeah. set, Janice, to separate psychology from spirituality because I think we need to know what the difference is, if you understand me. We need to know when we're talking from our personal psychology and when we're talking from something much more expanded, you see. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So how do you know mm. when it's something more expanded? Mm -hmm. Well, you you know you're not bound by the ego state, don't you? You know, mm. when it's expanded and you're in the spiritual realms or the, your divine nature is authentically present, then I think you you know, or, you know, I try to help people to know that they're not in that place bound by the small self or the ego. Mm. 
Okay. Yeah. So it's not about, uh, what should we say, self-pride or, you know, what I can accomplish or look how great am I or uh, in any shape or form. It's about right. the divine coming through. It comes through yeah. you. And everyone can do it in a sense. Everyone's it's available, should we say. Sure. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm trying to distinguish that, but not just... Uh, you know, in a summary way, but in a way that actually uh, talks about, explains about how you get there and what the difference is and, uh, you know, how you can, again, take the wrong turn here and there into more delusion or keep going to the authentically sacred spiritual place, which, of course, is ever present. It was never anywhere else. Oh, no, it's Right. right there inside of you. It's right, right. here, yeah. Mm. So and, it's a um, curious matter, isn't it, the spiritual journey, because it's a, it's a journey to no place you have to, you know, you never had any distance from. No, that's right, yeah. So it's just all right there inside of you, and until you realize that, you're looking everywhere else but inside of you, aren't you? That's what you're doing, isn't it, in the spiritual journey, mm. is learning that there really is nowhere to go. <laughs> right. That's right. And you, <laughs> what there's you nowhere to go, about... but there's nowhere you need to go. That's there's right. nowhere you need to go, but you know it's a really long journey, isn't it, to to here? <laughs> yeah. It can be, yes. <laughs> yeah. And you've yeah. got to you've got to find out for yourself, really, don't you? Yeah, you have. It's to a do lifelong it for journey, uh, and yes, for me personally. Uh, you, you know, I had to go through some dark nights of the soul, if you will. Me too. To, yeah, I think everybody out there yeah. does. To be <laughs> open to that place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, there's there's oh. probably no avoiding it, is there? Did you uh, go? It doesn't seem to be. No. <laughs> Did you go no, through, I don't think um, we can make it several? easier. No. Did so you go don't... through several, Richard? Dark nights of the Did soul. Did I what? Go through several dark oh, nights of the soul. <laughs> of course, of course. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. I was born in the wrong family. You know, uh-huh. everything went wrong. You know, <laughs> twenty odd years right. of everything going wrong, at least. Mm-hmm. And um, it was a most confusing business, really, because I knew some. Th- I knew that something was true that didn't have any reference point in my life. Yeah. You know, there was there was no reference point for what I knew. Um, was real, and you right. know, we can call that awakening or God or the divine or whatever. I and mean, just see, I wasn't born into a family which had any sensitivity for that kind of thing, and the education system didn't have any acknowledgement oh, no. of that kind of thing. So Definitely for me, not. it was a long haul, long haul. And then I was 24, 25 or something, and I stumbled into um, this very strange world of. Uh, you know, therapists, counselors, healers, guides, spiritual teachers and whatnot. And I thought, oh, my God, I've come home. Mm. Yeah, that's what it's like, isn't it? After being in an education yeah. system where they're trying to make yeah. everybody into a round peg to go into a round hole, um, you know, yeah. knock your corners off and everything like that. And they don't um, yeah. give any credibility to spiritualism. And that's why there are so many children who are labelled uh, autistic or labelled whatever, and um, you know, and many times they're mediums. You know, they're they're um, sort of tapping into things that the teachers have no idea what they're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely, absolutely. I don't know if it's still like that these days. That's how it was for us, perhaps. That's how it was for me, absolutely. Yeah, I think people generally are becoming a bit more enlightened, and even their parents are, but mm. in many cases, um, they, they're, not, they're not going there, are they? I'm afraid not. That's why I wrote the book, you see, to yeah. at least mm-hmm. talk about it and put it out there, and, um, you know, I, t- I try to give it pe- to people when they come here, I say, read this, you know, and um, try to get the word out there, really. Yeah, well, that's mm-hmm. brilliant. Mm. So, you know, when you, were speak, when you were speaking about psychology earlier, um, do you believe in past lives? And if so, do you believe that your past life 
can have a, an effect on this life. But look, I'm really happy with past life stuff. I have to say, personally, a difficulty for me was, um, you know, I passed through a period where all my friends were interested, and um, we would all do this past life uh, regression work and stuff, and uh, it never worked mm -hmm. for me. So, I'm, no. you know, first off, I just, I just state my bias. You know, my bias is that. It never worked for me, and I know it worked for others, and it was very exciting, and, um, you know, I loved mm -hmm. hearing all about it, but I didn't have any direct experience of it for myself, so I don't really offer anything that I haven't already gone through or un understood or experienced, you know, and mm. the way I feel about past lives, at least in my work, sacred attention therapy, is it's hard enough understanding this life, it's hard enough getting the grips with the past life that was your, you know, your early 20s, your adolescence, your childhood. Most people have a very hard time penetrating all of the information and all of the, you know, what they have to learn from those periods of time. So whether it's past lives or, or not, or whether there's any need to go there on the whole, the past life I get most interested in is, you know, this life and how this yeah. life right. unfolded, right. because that's just full of material. It's just full of it. Sure. Oh, yeah. But yeah, having said that, you know, I, I, yeah. But having said that, you know, I'm not dogmatic, and if people bring to counseling sessions with me a past life, you know, I, live, I, I treat it just the same as this life. I mean, it's their way of mm -hmm. looking at it, and I, I honor that, absolutely. Yeah, well, I think, yeah. I, I think to myself also, I've got enough going on in this life to deal with. But um, I do think that if um, you see someone such as a medium who tells you that things went on in your past life that are really affecting you now, then, you know, check it out. But otherwise, there's enough yeah, going on yeah. now. Right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, you know, I would love somebody to tell me about my past lives and I actually knew it or had the experience or really connected with it. It would be great. You know, clearly it's yeah, I would love that people. Too. And uh, I'm full of envy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to have that experience. <laughs> yeah. It, it hasn't worked for my, me either, so I know exactly oh, yeah? where you're you are. You and me. <laughs> yeah, well, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> I've had a couple of past life experiences and that I remember. Yeah. You know, so mm -hmm. I was um, only because the information was coming through to me and I was getting it corroborated um, as yeah. I went along. And I just thought, wow, yeah. that was that was true. Because for a while you think that you're making it all up in your head, don't you? You know, but um, it was being corroborated by other things that I was reading or seeing round and about, uh -huh. you know. So I had I to know. sort of believe it <laughs> eventually. Yeah. So, That's fabulous. Hmm. I had so, a um, a, fr a friend, a wonderful old um, sort of witchy woman. She's dead now. She used to live in the south of England. And uh, I spoke to her one day about this. I said, how come I can't remember any of these past lives? And she, she said, and I, and I quote, she said, they were all too powerful. And oh. I said, well, what does that mean? She said, I... I said, what does that mean, you know, um, and she she didn't mm -hmm. say anything else. So so I was left with a kind of um, bewilderment, mm. you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, were you born oh, in England, Richard? I was born in uh, South London, yeah. Yeah, I thought you had an English accent. <laughs> but, yeah, um, I was born in, we lived in, we lived in Streatham in South oh, did London. You? Yeah. But, um... It's a funny thing because I always knew I would somehow not, you know, I'd be abroad at some point. I never thought it would be here, but um, I just always had this feeling that I'm not really, you know, I mean, I'm English and I'm also not, you know, this sort of feeling. Yeah, transatlantic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And somehow just I don't know, world citizen, or, you know, just not exclusively a national identity, shall we say. Yeah. And um, it's it somehow suits me to be in you know where I live now, which is in the mountains in uh, Andalusia, southern Spain. And uh, you know I'm right out of my culture really because um, you know this isn't the coast of Spain where there maybe is a lot of English people and and European mm. and American people. You know this is um, 
This is kind of like the Middle Ages where I live. It's very agricultural and full of people who are, you know, all related to each other, and it's very lovely, actually. Yeah, I bet mm. it is. Yeah, yeah, some people yeah. like to go back. In, I mean, t- to me, it would be like going back uh, 50 years in time. Yeah. You know, where you That's wake right. up and there's ice on your inside of your bedroom window and things like that, which I didn't yeah. enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, anyway, do you want to tell us about the R Hat project? Yeah. The, um, wow, you know about that. Great. Well, the R Hat project is a, at the moment, it's a vision, although it may be it comes about. There's a lot of interest in it um, from all over the place. And the R Hat um is uh, the project is to bring together a community of people who have who are intent on illumination, who they say enlightenment, because the arhat is a Sanskrit word, and it's from a legend that says there'll be I can't remember the number now, but something like sixteen arhats, you know, at the end of the current uh, era or eon um, that will open up a new period of enlightened enlightened uh, condition for humanity. So the Arhat project is about accelerating psychological and spiritual growth and development uh, by mm. living together communally and uh, practicing sacredly and spiritually and to some degree psychologically to get past um you know, conditioned and responses and survival strategies and things, and to create a truly spiritual community. So at the moment, there is um, some interest in southern Spain. A a property has been offered. And um, the trouble at the moment is the the interest in the Arhat project is so diverse. Um, You know, there's somebody in Russia, there's somebody in China, there's a few people in Australia, there's a number of people in America. So they're kind of all over the place. And I think what we have to do is have somewhere established to invite them their participation, really. But it will surely happen in time. Mm, This sounds brilliant. And there's quite a lot of people who would like to do things like that. And in fact, there is one in Scotland, the Findhorn, uh, Findhorn Project, isn't there? And you can go and stay well, that's there. Well, that's a fabulous... Yeah, that's a fabulous... I've, I've never been? been there, but I feel an affinity with it because, you know, I remember it starting in the 70s. You know, I'm old enough to remember all of that, and people were coming back with tales about it. And, uh, you know, it's all, it's been ever-present, really, in my in my consciousness, Finhorn. Mm. Yeah. So do you do retreats over there where you are now? Yeah, yeah, I do. Actually, we have retreats fairly constantly. Um, they're not group retreats, though. They are individual retreats where mm-hmm. I spend time with the uh, the retreatant every day, and then in between they do various you know tasks or exercises and things. And we now have a uh, what we call it. It's a little casita. It's a little um, traditional building that they live in and it's completely um you know you can have full solitude and just concentrate on uh, on inner work for a week or two weeks or three weeks or whatever wow sounds brilliant mm-hmm. yeah it was something that it just came together when we moved here this was 15 years ago we moved from england to here yeah. and as we started to build places i thought hang on, you know, we could build a little, we could, I, it was something that I would always have liked to have had, I think, you know, a lovely place where you were catered for and, you know, you just had a bedroom and a bathroom and a little living space and a veranda and you could just be on your own for a week or two weeks, three weeks, whatever you wanted and um, just go inside, you know, be with yourself. And uh, so that's what I created here. Um, mm. And that's what we've got. And uh, it, it's grown in popularity. I mean, we've had, I don't know, scores of people here now over the years. Um, and it's, you know, more or less always occupied, and which is great. Mm. Well, we have a friend um, that does something similar up in Stoa, near Milnthorpe, uh, South Cumbria. And he, mm-hmm. uh, Sean Bradley, and 
used to call himself the a- Barefoot Angel Man. <laughs> and uh, he, w- he was actually <laughs> a nursing monk. He was a monk for quite a lot of years. And then um, he found that the um, Catholic religion wasn't, you know, for him anymore. So he got into spiritualism, etc. And he runs retreats up there in store. And I've been on a couple up there. It's really good. Yeah, yeah, you spend time more, uh, meditating and things like that. It's really good. And it's great to uh, just take um, a bit of time out from your ordinary everyday life. And uh, I think it's really re- important, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Reconnect with your spiritual self. And in fact, you do that, don't you? Um, you go on um, sweat lodges and things like that, don't you, Gary? Go to sweat lodges. Oh, yes, absolutely. Sure. Mm. Mm-hmm. It's the way Indians took a shower and went to church at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> sort of. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> so you've got. Um, but uh, it was a, yeah, it was a way to purify, purify your thoughts, purify your heart, purify your body uh, at the same time, and in order to get through it, you had to really, really get deep into your heart center. Mm. To, to to make it through the ceremony. Uh and that's to help you forget about your yourself and you suffer. You suffer a little bit for everyone who those who are suffering a lot. So uh it uh yeah, it's uh, some people go to church, you know, wearing a, a breast suit and shine shoes. Mm. Um, some people do it crawling on their hands and knees, uh you know. Uh, into the door of a sweat lodge. It doesn't matter. Uh, whatever way moves you to spirit, uh, you know, and there, there are many, many, many ways. Uh, those are those ways are to be celebrated. Yeah. Yeah, they are. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. So, what else uh, is going on? Um, your sacred attention therapy—that's uh, SAT for short. You've got um, mm. therapists and counselors. You've got psychotherapists and psychologists. Mm. And mm. Um, do you want to speak thing about, about that? The, th- yeah, thing about the sacred attention therapy training is, and this is what I'm trying to put over to people, is you don't have to be a... Um, I'm a kind of, in some ways, a sort of traditional psychotherapist. I mean, I talk to people. I do body work and so forth, but... Um, you know, I sit there and I talk with people and we work through stuff. Uh, that's my work as a therapist. And what I'm trying to put over at the moment is sacred attention therapy training is also for people who uh, have a unique, uh, their own unique way of healing. Uh, so, for example, movement and dance. Uh, mm-hmm. So, for example, uh, art and creativity. Um, and you know many you know all the healing modalities you can think of can all benefit I think from the way in which we present the training because the training gives an underlying sense of the development of a human being and that is through psychological and spiritual stages of development so you can actually take sacred attention therapy not in order to be a counselor or a psychotherapist necessarily in any case the training is also for people's self-training their own experiential inner work is developed through the through the training itself it's not exclusively for um practitioners or you know professional healers or anything um it -hmm. is both that and also for your own inner work i mean that that's on purpose because i don't i don't want to promote a kind of elite where we have our um you know we're the expert healers and then there's the lay people or something um so we're we're trying to level that and uh, call that into question because you know everybody is their own healer as such and everybody is um when they're on their right path of course is doing it for themselves so just that message, really, that the sacred attention therapy training is for um, people who practice healing in all sorts of different ways because it will offer some clarity on the enormous complexity of human beings in the 21st century. You know, we've become so complicated. 
even yes, looking we back. Have. Haven't we? You know, I mean, even yes, looking definitely. back. Mm-hmm. I'm 65 yeah. this year, so, you know, I grew up in the 50s and so on, and what a simple time when we look back. The 50s and even the 60s and the 70s were. Looking back, they just seemed really quite simple in a lot of ways, and we've become so complex now. Um, in 21st century, I think we need a whole new way of looking at therapy and healing and you know, psychospiritual guidance. So that's what I'm trying to do. That's what we're trying to do at the Center for Human Awakening is address the new complexity of being a human being in a, you know, a very, not only mixed up world, but very sophisticated and complex world. Mm. Mm-hmm. I think probably in the 70s, etc. cetera, they wouldn't have thought of themselves as being um, more naive and simpler than we are now. They probably would have thought to themselves that it's complicated then. Because I think each it's age relative. has its, its relative, own... It's isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Each age has its own um, sort of... What's the word? <laughs> Traumas and um, uh, th- things that go wrong for everybody out there. You know. Yeah, challenges. Yeah. Challenges. I couldn't think of the word. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> Gary, <laughs> there's somebody on the switchboard. If you want to see if that's um, uh, Shiloh called back in, or if it's someone else, and we'll just have a look. I believe it see. is. I'll go ahead and bring them on. Oh, the four eight zero area code four eight zero. You're on air. Is this Shiloh? Yes, it is. I actually did have a question now. A couple questions. Actually. Oh, good. Okay. Um, okay. My first question is in healing people or yourself or in dealing with yourself, um, is there any hope for people who are narcissists? Because they don't really have the same feelings I've found as most of us have. So how do you, how do you deal with somebody like that? Or how do you have a positive relationship? when you're with somebody like that in the um in the you know in the in the healing practice in my case in the therapy practice you're seriously very unlikely to get a narcissist in the chair opposite you I mean, I know there's an all yeah I know there's an all as you may know I mean I know there's an awful lot of um you know, it's it's a big thing at the moment. It's very popular. There's lots of talk about narcissism and the psychopathic mentality and all this kind of thing, and uh, and and rightly so. You know, because uh, in a way, the society uh, more or less is that, and so that's difficult. So we should try and understand, but you're very unlikely to get a narcissist, I think, coming for any healing uh, form, any modality of healing whatsoever, and certainly not counseling or psychotherapy where some openness and willingness to um, you know, understand yourself and your relationship with others is required. It's also mm. true of the psychopath, by the way, psychopathic mentality. So both are very unlikely to get into the chair opposite you if you're a therapist or a counsellor like me but having said that the times when I do get one very very few times are usually in couples work so mm-hmm. so it's when perhaps the, uh, the, the the partner in the relationship is with a narcissist or a psychopath and they drag them along Right. And, right, so and how somehow, do you um, heal yourself then to deal with them, I guess, would be a better question since they're not going to change. How do you, where do you begin in having to deal with somebody like that and still keep your sanity, you know? I think we have to understand that the narcissist actually is human too. And, you know, deeply mm-hmm. down inside, this is a very damaged individual. I mean, if if you... If you're talking about narcissistic uh, personality disorder, for example, I mean, because you might argue that many people are narcissistic, you know, or that you right, and I are right. to some degree narcissistic. But if you're right. you're talking about somebody who is kind of 85, 90 or worse, you know, percent narcissistic, in other words, self-centered, unable mm-hmm. to truly relate in any kind of a... Uh, reasonable or emotional way that has empathy and so on. What you also have is a severely...
damaged child inside. And if you can get to that, n not the other person in the partnership, because, you know, don't, don't try. But if uh, a therapist or someone has some understanding of narcissism, can get to the place where they gave up on relationship or they gave up on anything but survival of themselves and so that the world itself was occluded, you see, it, it, it goes out of focus, and they're mm -hmm. kind of hanging on for dear life, then you get to this place that's vulnerable, and you have to do it gently. You have to do it slowly. You have to do it uh, sensitively. And when you get there, it is possible to heal even the narcissistic state, even the psychopathic state. I mean, it's incredibly difficult. And yeah. as a psychotherapist, you don't get that many opportunities to do it, but it is possible. I have done it, but it must be very gentle and slow and sensitive. And as for the person in a relationship with someone like that, I mean, insist that they go see someone who understands that state. or I mean, insist that they do, because they're not happy either. See, they're right. not happy not being, uh, not able to touch the world, not able to be able to touch feelings in relationship to another. I mean, what's, what's going to make you happy about that? And, you know, as a narcissist, it's a great mis It doesn't look like it, but that person is suffering. And so if they can be directed to, and they probably won't go on their own, if they can be virtually pushed into going to see one has some understanding of this, and if they can touch that place where they realize they're isolated and they are alienated and they're not living a truly connected, you know, communicable, um, empathetic life of any sort, then, you see, there's, type, there, there's the, um, that's what you have to work with uh, to get them to a state of humanness, you might say. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, also, how much does your retreat cost? Like, what is what is the average? I mean, what is something like that? The retreat. Well, there's different kinds of retreats that we do. There's like full catering retreats, and you know, where you cater for yourself. And I mean, off the top of my head, it's something like uh, it's something like between four hundred and one and a half hundred, depending on what you actually do. Okay. Oh, sorry, four hundred euros to um, 1,500 euros, depending on, you know, what what you want and how long you want what to What is that in American money? <laughs> well, yeah. euros isn't so very difficult, uh, sorry, isn't so very different to American dollars, I don't think, at the moment. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, really? Pretty close I, to I, think, I think that's mm -hmm. right. There, there's a little difference, but not a big one. Okay. Yeah, there's, uh, the euro is slightly more than the dollar, but not much. It's not much, is it, Gary? Not much. Well, no. it's not much different to the pound at the minute either. <laughs> I know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, oh, that we do retreat have... sounds great. Thanks, Charlotte. Yeah, it, it sounds really good. Well, you can always get on Richard's website and check that out. Uh, do you want the website again? Yeah, please. It's um, centerforhumanawakening.com. W All one word. Yes. Yeah, center spelled T E I T E R, sorry, for humanawakening.com. And you can check out everything on these website. You've got all the information on there. And uh, we did have another caller, but they've just dropped off. So I don't know where they've gone. But I think we'll actually, we're going to be doing the meditation very shortly now. So we're going to ask Gary if he'd like to call in the four directions. What do you think, Gary? And then we'll light the candles, and then um, we'll do a couple of things, and then we'll get Richard to do his fabulous meditation. Um, I'd like to offer uh, a meditation that, if, if it feels right for you, please remember it, because I offer it for you uh, personally, but also for us collectively, because the theme of the this guided meditation is raising our energies into the heart center. And this is as important for us individually as it is for all of the humanity. Now, would you 
you begin by making sure you have a firm base. If you're sitting, please put the soles of your feet on the floor, on the ground. Or if you're cross-legged or sitting on the floor, make sure you have a firm and relaxed posture with a broad grounding. If your feet are on the ground, set them apart a little bit. Feel your bodies being supported by your seat or the floor or your cushion and relax into the into that support and take a minute just to align yourself so that your your back and your torso are straight but not overly rigid just feeling loose and natural with just enough tension to keep upright and to have the energy centers in alignment. Relax your legs, your feet, your toes, your pelvis. Relax your abdomen, your lower back, your chest and your upper back and your shoulders. Let the shoulders release and your arms and your elbows and have your hands just naturally in your lap, perhaps one on top of the other, just gently. And release the any tensions you may have in the facial muscles. Just gently bring the lips together and breathe a little deeper than usual. Take several slightly deeper breaths. And as you breathe out, consciously release any excess tension that remains. And just allow your body to be relaxed and alert, loose and natural. And after your deep breath, just return to normal breathing. Allow your mind to go into neutral. That's to say, don't interfere with thinking, but don't get caught in thoughts. Just a kind of surface noise, just a surface. Not an interference of any sort. And the same with any physical feeling senses just let them be there don't get in the way don't let them distract you from the exercise of moving energies into the heart center now we start i'd like you to start by noticing just bringing your awareness to the energy you have stored up in the lower energy centers lower energy centers means your pelvis, your abdomen, and your solar plexus. So bring your awareness to these in turn and sense the energies that are dammed up there, that perhaps have been prevented or not allowed to move freely within your body and has somehow become intensified, stuck perhaps, frozen in some cases, in the pelvis, in the abdomen, and in the solar plexus, which is below the heart, just between the lower ribs, where there's a slight pulse. You put your hand there, solar plexus. Now, there's a build-up of energies in us there, usually, of fear, anxiety, anger, pain, sometimes stifled or repressed creativity, or repressed power. Your pelvis, for example, can carry the imprint of strong urges you've held back 
in your life. Angry impulses you may have had to hold on to or chose to hold on to. And expressions of your own personal power you had to thwart in order to stay safe. These are just suggestions, but you witness, you contact, you bring your awareness to what is held or stuck in these lower energy centers. Acknowledge the energies, recognize them, sense them and feel them. And now I'd like you to trace them at least some of them, or one by one, back to seminal relationships or critical times in your life. This is the source of the damming up of these energies, the holding on to these energies in the lower energy centers of your body. Remember, recall, those relationships, those critical times in your life when you made commitments to yourself about how to behave, perhaps how you should behave, how you were pressured to behave, and how you should live what was and what wasn't acceptable, what was and what was not allowed. Now, when you're ready to do so, what I'd like you to do is to begin to release the energy that you've held in these lower centers. Release the energy through breathing, through giving the energies that are held in the centers your attention. and allowing the energies to move naturally upwards towards the heart. It's a natural flow of vibrancy. Breathe, be aware, and notice as these energies are acknowledged, recognized, even understood. Fear, the anger, the pain, the anxiety, the stifled, held, or repressed feeling, which is energy itself, naturally rises vibrantly. Now it's released in a natural flow upwards. And it flows upwards, of course, into the heart. Just as you bring attention to the repressed feelings, the feelings are allowed to release from the lower energy centers. And as you breathe, you breathe the energies through to your heart center. And energy is just energy. You're not bringing pain or fear or anger. But even if you are bringing those sorts of feelings through, those so-called negative feelings, remember they're, they're just energy. It's neutral. And all will be dissolved in the heart. And all will be accepted in the heart as energy. Your heart center embraces all of these conditions all of these energies. And this is what I invite you to do to release the held energies in the lower chakras or the lower energy centers into the heart which accepts and compassionately embraces those feelings which up to now you may not have allowed. Now, 
you'll notice as more energy is released into the heart center and you breathe more to allow it to be full, to expand into the new feeling of opening, of healing, of receptivity, of allowing, of the compassionate embrace of the heart. That you can continue the flow upwards into your throat, the energy center in your throat and your forehead. And finally, the very crown of your head. And as you do that, deep breath, deep breath. As you do that, you begin to feel connected from the base energy center in your body right to the very top, to the spiritual center. You begin to feel connected because of the flow, because of the openness, because of the acceptance of all the energies. They can all be embraced in the heart. And then they can be energies incorporated in the higher energy centers, you see. Breathe and feel that continuous flow. And if it feels right for you, remember to return to this practice of dissolving negative energies, energies that are made neutral in the heart center, in time centering yourself in the place of all healing, which is the heart center, and which also connects you to the higher sacred spiritual centers. For now, take two, three breaths and come back to the space you're in. Thank you so much. We've run out of time, I'm afraid. Okay, Jan. <laughs> that was absolutely <laughs> brilliant. Thank you very much. We've really enjoyed very having welcome. you on the show. I hope you come back Thank soon. Love to. And Thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. That was a wonderful meditation. Thank Absolutely you. brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you, and both. Um, Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, everybody.